It was a chilly October evening back in 2015 when my friends Dave, Jen, and I decided to embark on a camping trip in the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. We were looking forward to a weekend of relaxation, exploring, and bonding. I, for one, had been under a lot of stress from work, something I'm sure many can relate to. We set up camp near an old abandoned logging site deep in the heart of Monongahela National Forest. Despite the eeriness of the remote location, we were all eager to spend the weekend surrounded by nature. As nightfall arrived, we huddled around the campfire, sharing stories and making s'mores. We proceeded to talk about rumors of a twisted killer who supposedly inhabited these dark woods. The laughter gradually ceased as an unsettling silence began to sweep across our group. As I attended to the fire, something peculiar caught my attention. There, just outside our circle of light, was a bizarre arrangement of sticks and leaves. A failed attempt at a fire pit, or perhaps something entirely else. Little did we know that this seemingly innocent discovery would lead us to an unimaginable encounter with pure evil. The following morning, we embarked on a hike led by Dave through the endless trails surrounding our campsite. The forest enveloped us in its luscious green canopy, but as we ventured forward, drawn by curiosity, an overpowering scent of decay hovered in the air. We stumbled upon what appeared to be the remnants of an ancient symbol etched into the ground, roots entwined, horrifically unnatural. Suddenly from behind us came an intense snap. We whipped our heads around only for our eyes to land on nothing but empty space, giving us a sense of dread that slithered down each of our spines. Hey guys, Jen said nervously as she clutched her jacket tighter around her body. I really think we should get out of here. This place just doesn't feel right. Dave, unbothered by the ominous atmosphere, dismissed her concerns, eager to continue his exploration. So with tentative steps and glances over our shoulders, we marched forward with unease. As we delved deeper into the forest, the strange symbols grew in volume and detail. Symbols that looked less like something left by an amateur prankster and more like the cryptic warnings of an ancient civilization. Eventually, we found ourselves standing before a dilapidated cabin nestled sickeningly among gnarled trees. What the hell is this place doing out here? I whispered while stepping toward the decaying structure. Without heeding our reservations or fear of the unknown antagonist tormenting us from afar, we entered what looked to be an abode of pure wickedness. The cabin's interior was dark and damp, with a pungent stench enveloping every corner. Glimmers of light flickered through the gaps in the decrepit walls, revealing a sinister collection of stained and dismembered doll parts strewn about. A guttural roar bellowed from deep within the cabin, an abomination in human form lunging at us from behind a rotting doorframe. Writhing tendrils wrapped around this horrific figure, supernatural in nature, that had been lying dormant amongst piles of ravaged remains. We sprinted through the woods, pursued relentlessly by this monstrosity that defied comprehension. Panic clawed at our every breath as our footfalls echoed endlessly deep within the sinister heart of the Appalachians. As the sun began to set on the third day, we found ourselves at a small mountain village where we hoped to find refuge from the relentless creature known as the Red-Eyed Ghoul. A local hunter named Jeb recognized the description of our pursuer and warned us that it was an infamous beast in these Appalachians, responsible for numerous deaths and disappearances. He recounted the origin of this monster. It was once a man who had been wronged by his own kind causing him to seek out dark rituals that turned him into the red-eyed ghoul. Now fueled by rage and hatred, he lurked in these woods, preying on those who trespassed on his territory. Jeb believed some old spells or charms could help us ward off the ghoul, but couldn't pinpoint where to find them. Feeling desperate and exhausted, my companions and I split into groups to search for anything that could serve as protection against this abomination. Time was running out as darkness crept over the dense forest. I was paired with Emily, 
a brave young woman whom I had met since this nightmare began. As we scanned each cabin for any sign of magical artifacts or information, we shared stories and bonded over our common goal of survival. Just as twilight turned into night, Emily unearthed a worn journal hidden beneath a pile of dusty books in one of the dilapidated cabins. As we flipped through its pages, barely legible texts revealed long-forgotten incantations that could provide us with temporary immunity against the ghoul's influence. With newfound hope surfacing within us, we frantically memorized the chants before rejoining our fellow survivors. Together, under Jeb's guidance, we recited these spells and felt a spark of unwavering determination within us all. Armed with our newfound knowledge and resilience, we left the village with caution but no longer in fear. Hiking through unforgiving terrain, we knew the red-eyed ghoul would not be far behind us. However, we had changed from being hapless victims to well-prepared adversaries. As dawn broke, we reached an open field, deciding it would be perfect for a final confrontation. With grim expressions, we formed a defensive circle and began chanting the spell again and again. Moments passed in utter silence until the creature suddenly emerged from the trees. It was more horrifying than our imaginations could conceive. Humanoid but grotesque in every aspect, its putrid flesh hung from its bones, and its glaring red eyes burned with rage. Feeling a pulse of energy surge through us, we held our breaths and stood our ground as the ghoul charged towards us. To our relief, as it got closer and closer, the creature seemed to stagger and retreat. The spells were working. But as victory seemed within grasp, a shrill screech echoed throughout the field, leaving us disoriented and vulnerable. In that moment of chaos, the ghoul lunged at Emily. Desperate to save her, I threw myself in front of her just as she screamed one last incantation. We felt an unseen force crackle like electricity before it smashed into the red-eyed ghoul. It wailed in pain as it withered away before finally disappearing into a thick cloud of dark mist. We looked around at our surroundings, broken but alive, both thankful to have survived and realizing that together we had banished this darkness, if only temporarily. Though we lost some friends during this harrowing experience, those that survived formed an unbreakable bond vowing to never forget what transpired in those sinister forests of the Appalachians. United in strength and hope, we left that place behind us, knowing that even though the red-eyed ghoul was not genuinely vanquished forever, it would think twice before crossing paths with us again. But as we departed, I could not help but glance back one last time, only to see a pair of blood-red eyes lurking in the shadows. Even though we had managed to escape, it was apparent the red-eyed ghoul would continue to haunt these woods for years to come. It was a sweltering summer afternoon in July 2003 when my friends and I decided to meet up for a reunion camping trip. Mark Johnson, Michael Reynolds, Danny Baker, Lisa Simmons and I, all high school buddies, had not seen each other for years, and it was the perfect opportunity to reconnect. We chose Shade State Park in Indiana because of its picturesque landscape, which allowed us to escape the city's buzz for a weekend. I'm not sure I'll be able to survive without Wi-Fi, Lisa jokingly groaned as she loaded her backpack into the trunk of my car. You'll manage? Danny playfully shoved her shoulder. Besides, it's only two days. On our way there, we were laughing and exchanging stories about our lives thus far. The conversation eventually veered towards scary, real-life encounters. Well, just last month, there was a guy in my apartment building who had an allergic reaction to his throat lozenges. I died on the spot, Michael recounted. Ew, that's so gross. Lisa cringed at the thought, but thankfully she had no idea what awaited us all. We arrived at our campsite just before sunset, thrilled with adrenaline and excitement. After pitching our tents and starting a campfire, we began grilling some dinner while the sky darkened across the rolling hills. 
After filling ourselves with delicious hot dogs, we huddled around the fire, sipping on cold beer and reminiscing fondly about the old days. Soon after, Mike noticed something strange in the trees surrounding our campsite. Through squinted eyes, he said, There's someone watching us, or something. We fell silent for a moment, but then burst into laughter, brushing it off as a typical tall tale meant to scare us into submission. Typical Mike. The first day rolled on without incident. We went hiking, swimming, and even did some bird watching. Our relaxation could not have been more complete, or so we thought. As night fell on the second day, everything took a drastic turn for the worse. We were just sitting down after roasting marshmallows for s'mores when Lisa shrieked at the slight rustling she heard in the bushes. We turned our flashlights in its direction and caught a glimpse of something horrifying, a silhouette of a person with an unnaturally twisted form standing amongst the trees. In that instant, it fled, but we were left shaken and unsettled. Mark attempted to shake us out of our stupor. It was probably just some deer or another camper. None of us, however, were convinced. In fact, we decided that it was best to pack up and leave first thing in the morning, taking no chances with this sinister presence. As we sat inside our tents that night, none of us could fight off the lingering fear that enveloped us. All we could hear were our breaths as we attempted to get some rest before tackling the new day. Suddenly, a violent scream shattered the silence, followed by a sickening crunch. In an instant, all four of us darted out of our tents and rushed towards the blood-curdling scream's source, which happened to be Lisa's tent. The sight that met our eyes was gruesome beyond belief. Lisa's body lay lifelessly on the ground with her arm bent at an impossible angle. Now panicking, Michael frantically checked her pulse. She's still alive! he cried out, wiping tears from his eyes. That's when Mark noticed something further away, a trail of irregular footprints leading into the dense forest surrounding our campsite. We decided to follow the trail of footprints, hoping to find out what had happened and who was responsible. As we ventured farther into the forest, we came across a man staggering towards us. He looked disheveled and shaken. Help me, he pleaded weakly. I managed to escape from him, but he's still back there. Who's he? Michael asked urgently. Crazy Jeremiah, the man answered breathlessly. I heard rumors about him living in these woods, but I never thought they were true until I saw him with my own eyes. Our hearts raced as we listened to him describe Crazy Jeremiah, a tall, scarred man with wild hair and a haggard appearance. His face was marked by years of living in the wilderness, making him even more terrifying to behold. He was known for his unpredictable nature and violent tendencies, which earned him a notorious reputation among the locals. We continued deeper into the woods with caution, looking over our shoulders constantly for any signs of crazy Jeremiah. Soon we came across a small abandoned cabin. That must be where he lives, Danny said quietly, pointing at the building. As we approached the cabin, we noticed several sinister items scattered around it. Rusty chains, a bloody axe, and hunting traps. There was no doubt that this was Crazy Jeremiah's lair. Suddenly, a loud scream gave us chills. It was coming from inside the cabin. Cursing under our breaths, we burst through the door and found ourselves in a dimly lit room filled with the most horrifying sight any of us had ever seen. People were chained to the walls or lying on makeshift beds, battered, bruised, and covered in filth. In the midst of this gruesome scene stood Crazy Jeremiah himself. He turned to face us with a sinister grin, revealing yellowed teeth. Michael quickly stepped forward and swung his flashlight at Crazy Jeremiah's head, knocking him unconscious. Without wasting time, we untied the captive victims and led them out of the cabin. After making sure that everyone could walk or at least limp, we began to make our way back to our campsite. Suddenly, we heard a loud thud behind us and realized that Crazy Jeremiah was gone from the cabin. He had somehow managed to escape our clutches and vanished without a trace. That madman is still out there, Mark whispered with a shudder. 
As all of us hurriedly returned to our campsite with the victims, we couldn't shake off the chilling feeling that crazy Jeremiah was watching us from afar. Even as we got back into our vehicles and drove away, our gazes kept darting back to the dense forest that hid our nightmares. Crazy Jeremiah was still at large, and though we had managed to save these innocent people, our brief brush with this wicked man left us haunted by an unshakable sense of terror. As we drove on, one question lingered in our minds. Would anyone ever be able to stop him? I remember the exact day when I left for a camping trip. It was March 12, 2019. A group of friends and I decided to venture into Black Canyon National Park in Colorado for a weekend of unplugging from our fast-paced lives. My name is Mark Thurston, and at the time of this horrifying experience, I was with four other friends, Bill Jakes, Sally Grimes, Becky Thompson, and Peter Foster. The first day was blissful, full of laughter and reminiscing. Everyone exchanged witty jokes, the kind that made us laugh until our sides hurt. We set up camp near a gently flowing river, an idyllic spot surrounded by towering pine trees. However, as we prepared dinner on the second day, we noticed something strange. Our food supplies seemed to have been tampered with, containers were left open, and things appeared to be missing. Of course, we assumed it must have been a hungry animal, or even just an overly curious squirrel. We didn't think too much about it, but that night changed everything. We were rudely awakened by horrible shrieking noises coming from just outside our tents. Scrambling out to investigate the source of the sounds, we came across a horrific sight that none of us will ever forget. Bill had wandered off in search of more firewood earlier that evening, but hadn't returned in time for dinner. There he was now, sprawled across the ground in front of our campsite, battered and bruised, soaking wet, with bits of leaves and twigs tangled in his hair. A chilling wind swept through the campsite as we tried to make sense of what happened. All we could deduce was that some unknown force had attacked Bill. Though he lay there whimpering in pain, it still felt like our friend was one of the lucky ones. At least he was still alive. As if on cue, it began raining the soft patter of droplets against the trees making our objective that much harder, finding medical help in a hurry. With no reception and no clear path to follow through the thick woods, we struggled to think of any plan that didn't involve leaving someone behind. It was Peter who eventually decided to stay with Bill, using his experience in first aid to tend to his wounds. The remaining three of us, Sally, Becky, and I, trekked through the dark for what felt like hours. Dread clung heavy to every step we took away from the smoldering embers back at camp. What if whatever had attacked Bill was still out there? As trees loomed overhead, dark silhouettes against the starlit sky, the idea became less and less absurd. A sudden blur off the beaten path caught my attention. A tall figure with piercing eyes stared directly at us. For a brief moment, Time stood still as blood rushed through my veins. Alerting my companions before it disappeared into the depths of the forest, my heart pounded fiercely. Without warning, a sickening crunch echoed through the woods, followed by an ear-piercing scream from Sally. My flashlight illuminated her crumpled body on the forest floor, her leg bent at an unnatural angle. Becky and I rushed to her aid without hesitation, heartbeats thundering in our ears. At this point, fear roiled within all of us. It seemed that whatever had attacked Bill and now Sally was stalking us. Still trapped miles from help in a never-ending sea of trees, we knew every second counted. A chilling realization hit me then. Whatever this thing was wanted us terrified and broken. It aimed to wear us down before moving in for its final strike. Slowly rising back onto our feet amid petrified whispers, tear-streaked faces stared back at me. With each new snapping twig or unidentified rustle, panic seemed to tighten its grip on all of us. The darkness engulfed us as the rain continued to fall, 
fatigue whittling away at the last of our optimism. It was then that something large and malevolent leaped at us. I stumbled backward, narrowly avoiding the sharp talons of the beastly creature, now identified as the Ripper. We had heard rumors of its existence from a terrified hiker who claimed to have narrowly escaped its fury. The Ripper was known for mutilating its victims with razor-sharp claws, leaving nothing but savagely torn flesh littered across the forest floor. The other members of our group scattered, everyone running blindly in different directions. I sprinted behind a large oak tree, my breath ragged from fear. I could hear the screams of my friends being snatched one by one by this abomination. Suddenly, I was yanked from my hiding place and thrown against the tree trunk. My head pounded from the impact, and I looked up at the horrifying visage of the Ripper. Its deep red eyes stared at me with a seemingly insatiable hunger. Its grotesque face was twisted into a terrifying, wide-mouthed grin, revealing rows of dagger-like teeth slick with crimson. Thunder crackled above me, as if the storm itself had unleashed this evil upon us. Please, I begged, barely able to choke out the words through my terror. The Ripper cackled an unnerving laugh and raised one of its monstrous hands to rake its gleaming claws across my chest. But before it could strike, a gunshot rang through the air. The creature recoiled and howled in pain as black blood oozed from a fresh wound on its shoulder. From somewhere in the darkness emerged Hank, one of our fellow survivors who had come armed with his rifle. The Ripper hissed menacingly, but retreated into the shadows from where it came. My legs were weak and shaky, but somehow I managed to regain my footing. I glanced around. Most of my friends were dead or missing. There were only three of us left standing in that forsaken place, surrounded by death, fear, and the night closing in on us. Hank yelled for us to follow him. He had spotted a small cabin not too far from the carnage. Our hearts raced as we ran for our lives, praying that we wouldn't be the next victims of the Ripper's bloodlust. The cabin offered little comfort, but it was a solid barrier between us and our tormentor. We barricaded ourselves in, using furniture and whatever we could find to pile against the door and windows. It wasn't until dawn that an ominous scream echoed around the forest. The sun's rays peeked through the cloud cover, casting long shadows across the now silent woods. Exhausted and shaken to our cores, we had no choice but to make our way back to town to report this nightmarish ordeal. Shaken by the horrific events, our group disbanded, forever scarred by memories of that fateful night. As word spread of the Ripper's rampage, panic gripped the townspeople. No one dared venture into those woods. Over time, the terror faded into legend. Some claimed that the ravenous brute still roamed the shadowy edges of town, prowling for its next prey whenever someone ventured too close to its dark domain. Others believed it had slunk back into some hidden lair deep within the forest, waiting for new souls unwary enough to enter its territory. I moved far away long ago, determined never again to relive those terrifying moments under the monstrous gaze of that unspeakable evil. Yet even now in my dreams, I can hear its sinister cackle piercing through my peaceful sleep. A chilling reminder that no matter how distant I have become from those haunted memories, the nightmare remains uncaptured and always lurks just out of sight. It was a sweltering summer afternoon on July 27, 1999, as I loaded up my trusty old Ford Explorer with camping gear for the weekend. My friends Nathan Reynolds, Julie Brown, and David White eagerly awaited our escape from the mundane routines of our daily lives. Our destination, Holly Campground in Montana, is nestled amongst towering pines and crystal-clear lakes. As we arrived at the campground, the sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows across the forest floor. We set up camp near a serene meadow that seemed untouched by our presence. After pitching our tents and unloading our provisions, we built a fire to cook dinner. The scent of pine needles filled our nostrils 
as we roasted hot dogs and toasted marshmallows under the canopy of stars. Perhaps it was all too typical that Nathan started telling jokes around the fire, causing us all to laugh uproariously. That evening was filled with moments we all cherished, card games by lantern light, reminiscing about past adventures and sharing secrets we'd never told before. The first sign of trouble came when we woke up early in the morning to find an inexplicable gash on David's forearm. We couldn't explain how it had happened. He hadn't noticed anything unusual during the night or felt any pain. It was unnerving, but I decided that it could have just been an accident. Maybe he'd scratched himself on a branch while sleepwalking. As the day wore on, I grew increasingly uneasy. The once inviting meadow now seemed to hold an oppressive silence over us like a heavy curtain. While hiking through the forest that day, a rotting stench lingered in patches where no source could be identified. As evening fell again, Nathan went searching for firewood only to discover crudely made fetishes fashioned from twigs and animal bones, symbols we'd never seen before that left us feeling uncomfortable and intruded upon. Later on, as we huddled around the fire for warmth, the distant sounds of leaves crunching and branches breaking became impossible to ignore. Convincing ourselves it was just wildlife roaming through the woods, we attempted to brush off the anxiety creeping in. At midnight, our blissful ignorance came to an abrupt end. A scream pierced through the darkness outside our tents, one that sounded like a quarry offered mercy to the unnerving silence. Scrambling outside with our flashlights, we found Julie collapsed on the ground near her tent, clutching her bleeding leg. The wound was long and gaping, as if struck by an unseen force. David tried to maintain composure, while Nathan and I frantically applied a makeshift tourniquet and bandage. In that perilous moment, we all felt that staying in that cursed campground any longer was tempting fate with each passing moment. We resolved to haphazardly pack up our belongings and evacuate Julie to the nearest hospital without delay. As we began tearing down camp in a frenzy, the noises from earlier grew louder and closer. Whispers in the night wind seemed to grow bold enough to mingle with unintelligible words beneath their breaths. David, who had been packing the last of his gear into the car, suddenly let out a gut-wrenching yell. A large, jagged bone had violently embedded itself into his calf, tearing through muscle and sinew. How David hadn't noticed his own assault until that point sent shivers down my spine like icicles detaching from a frozen overhang. Nathan and I struggled to get him inside, while also ensuring that Julie remained conscious through her pain. As we frantically finished preparing for departure, sweat dripping from our brows in equal portions of fear and exertion, my own chest tightened in anticipation of some fearsome, unseen fate. With no small measure of reluctance, I turned back to face the dark forest one last time. I could almost feel the contours of the malevolent force that had pursued us, tall and sinewy, greedily consuming the darkness that surrounded it. That force had a name, and the name was Xander. The night was closing in, and the atmosphere was heavy with uncertainty. My friends and I had been followed for days, unable to shake off this relentless being that seemed to find pleasure in our torment. How did I know it was Xander? from an old hermit living on the outskirts of our town who claimed to have encountered him decades ago. He described Xander as an enigmatic creature, human-like in form, but with inky black eyes and intelligence sharper than any mortal. The old man claimed that Xander fed on terror, choosing his victims carefully for their vulnerability and dragging out the hunt to savor every last drop of their fear. Resolving to stop this monster, my friends and I devised a plan, a trap to ensnare Xander and put an end to the chase once and for all. Jane, known best for her cunning mind, suggested creating a lifelike dummy as bait. She rigged it up with explosives that would detonate upon contact with Xander's dark energy. It was late at night when we set our plan into motion. James carefully transported our makeshift bomb while Jane stood close by 
clutching the remote detonator. I hid in the shadows at a safe distance, praying for it all to be over. We waited in tense silence as time ticked away. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., until finally the moment arrived. We felt rather than saw Xander approach with malicious intent. He couldn't resist his own hunger for fear. Jane acted fast, pressing the button on the remote just as Xander reached for our decoy. A deafening boom filled the night air as flames illuminated the forest around us. For a brief moment, we celebrated victory over an unseen enemy. But as the smoke cleared and we dared approach what should have been ashes, our hearts sank. There was nothing. No body or sign that Xander had ever been there. A chilling realization hit us. Like the embodiment of fear itself, Xander could not be killed or captured. We decided it was time to stop running and face the fact that Xander would always be out there, feeding on the collective fear of anyone he set his sights on. With a mix of trepidation and acceptance, we made a pact to no longer allow fear to control us. As we headed back towards our town, I couldn't help but feel a deep anomaly within me. Xander was still out there, a whisper away from any unsuspecting victim. Though we had failed in our attempt to end his reign of terror, maybe, just maybe, it would be enough to shift the balance for some time. That night marked a turning point in our lives, giving rise to an eerie suspicion that Xander would always be there a dark force twisting in and out of reality as if watching from the shadows. This shared dread offered an unsettling bond between us, forging an unspoken connection that would forever loom over our sleepy town. Years went by, and with each new generation came whispers of the mysterious figure living at the edge of their nightmares. And yet, somehow, through it all, life carried on defiance never fully relenting to the gnawing feeling lurking just out of sight. At the stroke of nine in the morning on April 14th, 2006, I closed the trunk of my car and looked up at my college buddies, Ethan, Maya, and Daniel, each one just as excited as I was. We were all turning 22 this year and had grown up together in our small town of Bryan near Houston, Texas. The camping trip to Crockett National Forest was going to be an adventure we would remember for a lifetime. The sky was a clear baby blue as we piled into my old Toyota Camry, windows down and music blaring. Four hours later, we hit the green sanctuary that was Crockett National Forest. By mid-afternoon, our campsite was set up, tents erected, fire crackling, and dinner simmering in a pot over the flames. We hadn't been there more than two hours when we discovered footprints leading away from our campsite. Ethan suggested that they were too big to be humans, but I retaliated with a laugh, saying they probably belonged to some drunken lumberjack who got lost and stumbled through our campground. That night, as we sat around our warm fire by ten o'clock, we listened to the crunch of footsteps growing increasingly closer. An uncomfortable silence fell over our group as we stared into the darkness beyond our campfire's glow. Guys, whispered Maya, her face pale with fear. I think I just saw someone over there. What do you mean someone? Daniel asked with quiet apprehension. There's a tall figure behind those trees, she said pointing toward where the footprints had led earlier in the day. I resolved that one by one, we would gather our things and head quietly back to Ethan's sturdy Volvo for shelter. But within seconds of making that decision, our plans crumbled before us like dust. The stranger emerged from between the trees, not a man or animal, but something entirely different. Around six and a half feet tall, with stringy, unkempt hair that hung over its face, its skin was oily, as if it had been dipped in crude oil and dark as night. Its eyes glowed like embers in the darkness. Run! I shouted, my veins coursing with a volatile mix of fear and panic. 
We sprinted through the trees towards Ethan's car, but soon realized Daniel was no longer with us, his screams echoing through the woods. We had to leave him behind. There was no way we could face whatever that thing was. Ethan fumbled with his keys to unlock the Volvo, and each second felt like an eternity. The creature took slow, deliberate steps towards us, grinning maliciously before lunging at Ethan just as the car's flashing red alarm stopped and we heard the familiar beep of unlock. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, and Maya and I escaped from that forest without looking back. The news came later that Daniel's mangled body had been discovered not far from where we'd left him. The official statement confirmed that he'd been ravaged by a bear. However, we knew all too well that it wasn't just some ordinary animal. Years later, I found myself sipping coffee in the corner booth of a diner one early Texas morning, reminiscing about our encounter with the beast when Ethan walked in. He made for a strikingly mysterious figure, bathed in shadows against the sunlight that streamed through the window. He grinned as he approached me at my table, a smile too eerily familiar considering that night we'd never speak of again, but privately mourned. At that moment, I suddenly realized all too late, that Ethan had never made it out of Crockett National Forest alive either. He lunged at me across the table as other diners shrieked in terror. I tried to reason with Ethan, but it was useless. This was not the friend I knew. The waitstaff called the police as people attempted to stop Ethan's relentless and violent behavior. As I managed to break free from his grasp, my phone rang. It was Jake, another friend of ours, who had been present that night in Crockett National Forest. Gasping for breath, I answered, Jake, you won't believe what just happened. Jake didn't sound much better than how I felt. You're not going to believe this either, man. He paused for a moment before continuing. I found a news article from a few years back describing a creature named Bloody Face, an urban legend among the people living near Crockett National Forest. The mention of the name sent chills down my spine. Jake continued, It's said to impersonate people it has killed before hunting down its next victims. My eyes were locked on Ethan as he fought against those restraining him. This couldn't be real. It all seemed like a sick nightmare. I read that Bloody Face is some sort of demonic entity, Jake explained, his voice shaking. It can only be stopped by destroying the body it inhabits or forcing it to return to its original form. I racked my brain for ideas as chaos erupted around me. Suddenly, an idea dawned on me that might just work. Jake! I shouted over the commotion. Meet me back at Crockett National Forest tonight. Bring some gasoline and matches. Going against my better judgment, I grabbed a kitchen knife from the nearest table and tossed it toward Ethan, or what we now believed was Bloody Face inhabiting him. It buried itself into the creature's arm, making it wince in pain but causing no serious damage. At least now the police and bystanders knew how dangerous our assailant was. I made my way out of the restaurant as sirens wailed in the distance. I had little time to act, and I knew this was the only hope of stopping Bloody Face. As night fell, Jake and I gathered at the forest's edge with the gasoline and matches, we followed Ethan's last known path on that fateful night. As we ventured further in, we came across something horrific. There, among the trees, was a rotting corpse that looked eerily like Ethan. We were too late, I whispered hoarsely, realizing now that our friend had perished in these woods and Bloody Face had taken his place. Knowing what needed to be done, we doused the body in gasoline and struck a match. The flames engulfed the remains while we stood by silently, praying that this would put an end to Bloody Face's reign of terror. Moments after the fire began to die down, we received a text from a mutual friend informing us that Ethan, or whatever had been posing as him, had escaped police custody and was nowhere to be found. Jake looked at me desperately, realizing our plan had failed. We didn't stop it, he whispered. I clenched my fists and tried my best not to show weakness. It wanted us to find Ethan's body, 
it toyed with us. As we turned to leave, I couldn't shake this terrible feeling that we would never be free of Bloody Face's grasp. Whatever force controlled him or this land seemed stronger than anything either of us could have anticipated. Now we wait, knowing that Bloody Face is still lurking out there somewhere, biding its time until it can strike again and inflict its horror on more unsuspecting victims. It was a warm June morning in the countryside of Vermont when my buddies and I decided to take a weekend camping trip up to the majestic green mountains that loomed in the distance. There's something about the sounds of nature, the smell of earth, and the open sky above you that makes you feel alive, especially after slaving away at your 9-to-5 job in the city. I had planned this trip with my friends Jake, Vincent, and Casey, a group I treasured for their ability to have our laughter carry us through any hardship. As we drove away from our mundane lives in Jake's rusty pickup truck, our anticipation grew. That evening, as we approached our designated campsite miles deep into the forest, we came upon a curious sight that still makes my hair stand on end. Scattered throughout the trees were countless effigies made from sticks and small animal bones, eerily smiling down on us with hollow eyes. Even Jake stopped his crude jokes about the locals' idea of art and glanced around uneasily. Once we pitched our tents, each with their Uniqlo sleeping bag, we gathered around the fire, comparing notes on this peculiar encounter. The atmosphere had dramatically shifted from light-hearted banter to uneasy silence. That's when I cracked a clever joke about Vincent's fear of pigeons turning into a fear of stick creatures as a relief to reach normalcy again. The night pressed on, and eventually a chorus of snores resonated throughout our campsite. I woke up sometime during the night with an urgent need to relieve myself. As I stumbled out of my tent, something caught my eye that sent shivers rippling through me. Several more stick figures had appeared near the campfire, and they seemed to be moving towards us. I swallowed hard, employing sarcasm as an armor against fear, as I muttered under my breath how Vincent must have turned into one of them by now. I went back into my tent and decided to wait until daylight to investigate. Dawn arrived, glowing like molten gold. We spent the day hiking and soaking in the extraordinary beauty around us. However, a lurking sense of dread shadowed our every move. It was as if we could feel that terrifying occurrence breathing down our necks. When evening finally fell, we decided to huddle together inside two tents, strength in numbers. Suddenly, we heard a horrific scream coming from the other tent. Casey and I dashed over to Jake and Vincent's tent and found both of them lying unconscious on the ground with stick figures hovering above them. My pulse raced as I yelled for Casey to wake them up while trying to make sense of what was happening. The scene felt so surreal, like it was ripped straight out of a horror film, yet every detail of it was impeccably realistic. In a moment of desperation, driven by terror and fear for my friends and life itself, I grabbed a firelit branch from the dying flames and swung it wildly at the unnatural creatures. Run! barked Casey as we dove after Jake and Vincent, adrenaline coursing through our veins. The monstrous entities screeched behind us as they closed in with skin-crawling speed. As we bounded forward into untrodden darkness under an obscured moon or certain doom, none among us could predict what destiny held within its clutch. As we sprinted through the dense forest, the trees around us appeared to be gnarled and twisted, an eerie reminder of the monsters that pursued us. We managed to squeeze into a hidden crevice between boulders, momentarily escaping the predatorial abominations. They're still coming for us, exclaimed Vincent, as our heavy breaths filled the compressed air. Can you hear them? Casey whispered. Shh, quiet. Jake hushed them both. The blood-curdling sounds of the creature's vicious pursuit gradually faded away into the night. With no doubt about it, we narrowly escaped death in that dark forest. But what was that thing chasing us? From within the confines of our hiding spot, 
Casey pulled out his phone and snapped a blurry photo of what looked like a hulking figure with a monstrous visage. He sent it to a friend who was knowledgeable in the field of cryptozoology, hoping to identify the creature from hell. We've got to keep moving, urged Vincent, and we all agreed. Staying put would be an invitation to be found by those relentless killers. As we crawled out of our tight hiding place, Casey's friend responded with chilling information. The creature was known as Skulldor, he informed us as he read her message. It's ancient, merciless, and relentless, and now very close. Trudging on through the darkness at a careful yet timely pace gave way to feelings of paranoia or delusion setting in about whether this was truly happening at all. Could it have been just an elaborate prank gone wrong? But there was no denying the terror engraved within our souls. Upon reaching a decrepit cabin illuminated only by moonlight, we cautiously stepped inside. Anything would be better than remaining outside with Skulldor. Inside, we met an old man whose weary eyes betrayed his many years of sorrows and fears lurking within the surrounding woods. You came across Skulldor, didn't you? He asked, his voice trembling. There was no need to confirm our answer. Our expressions said enough. Stay here tonight, he said, leading us into a windowless room fortified with an iron door. As he locked us inside, we could hear him mumbling protective chants in an ancient dialect none of us recognized. Throughout the night, the pained screams and dreadful growls of Skulldor echoed through the forest, yet nothing pierced the iron door that stood sentinel before us. The following day arrived with morning light creeping over the horizon and into the woods. Skulldor had vanished. The old man shook his head when he saw it was gone, as if acknowledging his expectation of our eventual encounter with it again. We said our goodbyes to the old man and left the cabin. We hoped that we would never see Skulldor or anything like it again. With cautious optimism, we walked away from that dreadful place and back towards civilization, continuously checking behind us for any signs of what still might lurk in the shadows. It was June 12, 2019 when I planned an exciting camping adventure for my friends and me. We decided to explore Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, which is known for its cascading waterfalls and rocky peaks. The weather was perfect, and the breathtaking skyline vistas left us mesmerized. Assembling our small group of four, we set up camp beside a picturesque brook decorated with mossy rocks. I was joined by Mike, my best friend since childhood, Jennifer, a work acquaintance with an infectious laugh, and Mark, my cousin with an unrivaled love for the outdoors. During the first night around the campfire, sputtering with flames of red and orange, we found ourselves exchanging stories of wit and humor. Surrounded by laughter and hearty camaraderie, I couldn't comprehend any notion of unease. The second day detailed an afternoon hike through dense forests adorned in shades of rich emerald green. Our trek came to a halt when Mike stumbled upon a puzzling scene. A discarded tent, tattered and torn, lay near a blood-stained rock. Though concerning, we assumed it must have been left by reckless hikers, escaping a close encounter with more substantial wildlife. As dusk transformed into twilight on that same eerie day, Mark spotted something moving beyond the edge of our campsite. Initially shrugging it off as a regular wild animal attracted to human activity in their territory, we refocused on the ever-growing fire before us. However, stillness descended upon our once animated group when whispers from the darkness morphed into guttural snarls, ones that resonated with malicious intent. Instead of a benign forest creature, a ghastly figure emerged from the shadows a shambling silhouette cloaked in tattered clothing, skin-like decayed newspapers fluttering in the cold breeze. With terror gripping our hearts as firmly as it did our throats, Jennifer screamed, and we watched in horror as the grotesque monstrosity lunged toward our group with a chilling snarl. Without any time to react, we hastily dissipated any impending hysteria 
and fled for our lives. As we stumbled through the moonlit foliage in sheer panic, I spotted Jennifer tripping on a rogue root and sprawling headfirst into a sea of damp oak leaves. Our assailant closed in on her, his rancid breath stirring the air. Mike rushed to her aid but was brutally ensnared by the fiend's bone-clawed grasp. A sudden sense of primordial dread washed over me. Amidst the agony that punctured my eardrums, Mark and I knew our only chance for survival was to forge ahead without them. Desperation painted over concern. We continued running from an unknown terror that plagued our every step. The chilling cries of pain from our fallen comrades haunted us as we sprinted further away. We traversed dense undergrowth and shallow ravines as sweat burned our searing lungs with every labored breath. It wasn't until we reached a break in the forest's suffocating embrace that we finally halted, faces pressed against dirt-streaked hands gasping for air. The twisted entity had seemingly abandoned its pursuit of us. Still, fear continued to pour through our veins like molten lava. As the forest loomed behind us, I conversed with Mark about what little options remained available. Our eyes continuously flickered beyond the trees, anticipating any sudden bursts from the unfathomable monstrosity. A guttural whisper carried by a crisp breeze sent shivers down my spine as I became increasingly aware of how useless resisting would be. As we continued to put distance between ourselves and the wretched forest, Mark stumbled upon a cabin hidden among the bushes. It seemed like our only chance at refuge. Cautiously, we approached, and realizing the front door was unlocked, we entered, quickly locking it behind us. We scanned the interior and found it to be a simple yet somewhat run-down space. The walls seemed to be filled with old newspaper clippings covering strange disappearances and mutilated remains found in nearby areas. Among them was an article with a headline stating, The Carnage Cult a community's worst nightmare. It was then that Mark found a crumpled note in one of the corners of the cabin. It read, Never speak its name, or the carnage cult leader will find you. Not wasting any more time, we went upstairs and barricaded ourselves inside a small room. Heavy footsteps resounded outside the window as we held our breaths for what felt like an eternity. They stopped abruptly, and then we saw something deeply disturbing. Severed hands taped together on a tree outside the window. Two days went by without anyone stepping out of that room. On the third day, a woman knocked on our door frantically. We hesitated but ultimately decided to let her in. She introduced herself as Mary and revealed that she was trying to escape from an unknown man who apparently led a cult responsible for all those unspeakable killings mentioned in the articles found in the cabin. Between panicked breaths, she mentioned that whoever said his name would face imminent death. Mark was desperate now. He felt compelled by some unrelenting need to know who this massacre orchestrator was. Silently pleading with Mary, Mark took out some paper and a pen from his pocket. She understood. She wrote Joseph Harris on it, before throwing it into the fireplace. As realization dawned on us that this cult leader creature was, in fact, a not-so-ordinary human being, we jumped at the faint sound of footsteps approaching. Petrified, we expected to see the ghastly figure pursuing us. Instead, more men and women, scarred and gaunt, emerged from the shadows as twilight approached. It appeared their lips were stitched shut. Mary ushered us outside as the air grew colder and the wind howled louder. She explained that these people were other survivors who were now cursed to roam these lands after unwittingly calling upon Joseph Harris. The sun was setting fast. We had to get out of there before darkness completely enveloped us. Clutching each other's hands tightly, we ran through the forest right along with those survivors turned lost souls, their agonizing groans echoing behind us. Finally, we reached civilization, a small town thriving in the daylight. However, it was apparent that this newfound sense of safety wasn't everlasting or absolute. Those words, Joseph Harris, still lingered in our minds. We couldn't bear the thought of facing annihilation without knowing why, having any means to bring him down, 
or even warning others about this horrible truth. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, Mark and I struggled to find answers without drawing the ire of Joseph Harris towards ourselves or others. The horror remained lurking within our thoughts, but sharing that name was never an option. Further tormenting souls was out of the equation. But every now and then, maybe in a moment of sheer terror or unbearable curiosity, someone does utter his name, and thus this unending cycle of dread continues on into perpetuity. Perhaps it will always be so. And so ends a chapter in our lives that can never truly be closed, forever cursed by the knowledge that cannot be shared, lest it summon death itself upon us all. It was the hottest day of August when my buddies and I decided to take a spontaneous camping trip to escape the sweltering heat of the city. The weather forecast predicted cooler temperatures up in the serene mountains of Colorado, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for some camaraderie and outdoor exploration. Little did we know what awaited us in those lush, green woods. Our group consisted of myself, Mike, a tech-savvy programmer with a wicked sense of humor, Sarah, an adventurous soul with impeccable navigational skills, and our mutual friend Eddie, a gentle giant who had an uncanny ability to strike up interesting conversations with anyone he came across. We gathered at my apartment on Saturday morning, double-checking our supplies and planning our route before hitting the road. As we drove, I shared a funny anecdote about my recent misadventures at the DMV while Mike chimed in with his own tales of software development disasters. Juxtaposed with these light-hearted topics was Sarah's recounting of local mountain lore she'd been researching, which only added to the anticipation for our weekend retreat. When we arrived at our designated campsite nestled within the sprawling coniferous forest, we immediately set up and began preparing dinner on our portable stove. Soon after we devoured our meal, I noticed something strange hanging from a nearby tree, like a wind chime made of bones. Curiosity urged me closer. Inspecting it carefully revealed that several small animal bones were strung together with twine. As bizarre as it was, we assumed it must have been some primitive artwork left by previous campers. With no further leads to follow and daylight waning, we chose not to dwell on that grisly discovery. Later that evening, as shadows grew longer and darkness enveloped our surroundings, I lay inside my tent, listening to nature's nocturnal symphony that could rival any orchestra. Suddenly, amidst the harmonious sounds, I picked up on a faint rustling of leaves behind my tent. Unsettled, I peered out from under the canvas to investigate, but saw no sign of movement. After briefly discussing the situation with Eddie, who was still awake in his nearby tent, we concluded it had probably been an animal searching for food. Unconvinced but feeling slightly reassured, I drifted off to a troubled sleep. The next morning, we awakened to find our campground trashed, coolers overturned, supplies scattered, and deep gouges clawed into the tree trunks surrounding us. To our collective dismay, wildlife appeared to be completely disregarding park regulations on food storage. As Mike and Sarah started tidying up the mess, Eddie and I went in search of firewood for breakfast. That's when we found it. A bloody hiking boot that almost matched Sarah's shoe size lodged between the roots of a peculiarly gnarled tree stump. The tree itself bore shredded fragments of clothing and, more disturbingly, deep imprints that suggested someone had been struggling against whatever malevolent force entwined them with its branches. My blood ran cold as I recalled the bone wind chime, the sounds from last night, and those awful claw marks. Before we could investigate further or even fathom what creature might have caused such destruction, a guttural snarl echoed through the trees only meters away from us. Instinctively, Eddie and I grabbed what weaponry was at hand, a rusty hatchet and heavy walking stick respectively, but we never saw what approached us next. As shadows encroached upon us like tendrils from some primordial nightmare, we heard them move closer until they were right upon us. As the shadows closed in, 
a gigantic, monstrous being emerged. It stood at least seven feet tall, covered in matted, dark hair, and with elongated limbs that ended in sharpened, lethal claws. Eddie and I stared at this massive beast, our hearts pounding but without any screams escaping our lips. In an instant, it lunged at us with unexpected speed. We managed to dodge its first swipe, narrowly avoiding its deadly claws slicing through our chests. I swung my walking stick at its head, barely making contact as it nimbly dodged my pathetic attempt to defend myself. However, the connection seemed only to enrage it further. It charged at Eddie and ripped him apart with a single swipe. Horrified by what just happened to Eddie, I ran for my life, leaving my fallen weapon behind. Fear pulsed through my body as I scrambled over jagged rocks and fallen branches, desperately trying to create distance between myself and the beast. My lungs felt like they were on fire from the exertion, but stopping was not an option. I had one objective, to survive. As night turned into day and the sun began to rise, exhaustion forced me to rest behind a large boulder that would hopefully keep me hidden from my monstrous pursuer. During this tense respite, I couldn't help but curse the fact that we never bothered to bring our phones with us during this ill-fated vacation deep in the woods. Without them, there was no calling for backup or even looking up information regarding the creature that was after me. The haunting howls of the beast echoed through the trees, not too far from my hiding spot. It seemed like it was taunting me, daring me to come out of hiding, or perhaps just waiting for me to try. However, before I could decide on a course of action, something unexpected happened. Another strangled cry echoed through the woods, distinctly human. Forbidding myself to think about the possible consequences, I crept towards the sound. Carefully making my way through the dense foliage, I discovered a gruesome scene, a torn-apart tent, strewn with various camping gear and what looked like bits of human remains. The beast had apparently left its grisly mark there as well. Suddenly, seeing movement at the edge of my vision, I found a survivor, a fellow camper who appeared to be in shock. She clutched a photo of herself with her husband tightly in her hands, as something told me that he was no longer among the living. She introduced herself as Sarah and told me that she had caught a glimpse of the creature shortly before its attack. She mentioned its name, Grendel, something she had heard her husband mumble right before his untimely death. As we stayed low within the shadows, moving through our shared circumstances, it became harder for both of us to hide our suspicions that Grendel was looking for more prey, or perhaps seeking retribution for trespassing in its territory. Sarah and I continued to evade Grendel until we finally made it back to civilization, where we reported our harrowing experience to the authorities. Although I was well aware that most people would never believe such an outrageous story, I was relieved to see that Sarah and I received genuine concern from local residents. One elderly man living near a forest told us stories about an ancient legend connected directly to Grendel, claiming that several generations before us had encountered this terrifying creature. It seemed uncanny for Sarah and me both, but we held on to those stories with steadfast belief. The stirring questions surrounding Grendel haunted both of our nightmares for days to come as this unforgettable nightmare gradually settled into memory, muted by time but never erased from our minds. Even now, years later, on dark and silent nights, I cannot shake off the dread that grips me when I can't help but wonder whether Grendel is still out there, stalking through the trees, waiting for another unsuspecting traveler to chance across its murderous path.